those two meaning? Yeah, it's actually a very easy thought, but it's a lot. Uh, and it's very much based on very recent work, so she uh, really put towards us, uh, towards the categorical approach. And it's joint work with Bob and a computational linguist, Simona, and Stephen Clark. And he has actually prepared like one side of the talk. So. Um, so if you're a linguist, um, uh, your job is to analyze what people say, and this con uh, consists of a uh, form, pattern of speech, uh, patterns of sound, words, and it also has a content. And then, if you're a computational linguist, uh, you sort of, you want to do the same thing, but you're also interested in the mathematical structure for analyzing what people say, and you use some more fancier words, the syntax of what they say, and the semantics of what they say. The syntax has the meaning of what they say. Uh, so on the analyzing of the syntax, uh, there are various uh, approaches around. One of them is the algebraic or the logical way, referred to as type logical grammars. Um, mostly started by the work of Bagelel and Lambert in the 50s. Jim Lambert. Uh, so very roughly, you assign types, uh, like subject, object, linguistic types, to constituents of a phrase, a sentence, uh, hopefully, and then you want to compose, you want to use the, your algebra, your mathematical structure to compose these types to get a type for the phrase, and if it is well typed, then it's either a sentence or a question, uh, and things like that. So examples of these algebras uh, is the syntax calculus of Lambert, introduced in 58, which is a partially ordered monoid where uh, the multiplication is residuated. So it has a left, because it's a non-commutative, so it has a left and a right adjoint. So if this uh, monoid is complete lattice, then you get the adjoints for free. And then recently, uh, the formalism from the beginning of the 90s, this has sort of changed from a partially ordered monoid to dedicated multiplication. The partially ordered monoid where, instead of asking that the multiplication, the binary operation has adjoints, has a um, Each element uh, should have a left and a right adjoint. So this Lambic, also Lambic's work, and he refers to them as pre-groups. Sort of interesting is there is 50 years between those two pieces of work by the same guy. 40. 40, yeah. 40. Why? Why That's a lot. Actually, it's 42, and that's <laughs> interesting. Oh, what? Can you give us an example like the, the cat jumped over the wall? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> there is an example here. So on the semantic side, um, so this is the syntax. On the semantic side, there are, well, Two approaches we are interested in. One is the symbolic uh, model of meaning, they call it, which is uh, very, very, very closely related to these uh, type logics, to the algebra with which you type your sentence. And then you use your types to the algebra to, uh, to assign meaning to the words. Basically, very roughly put, to each type, you, the, some of the types you think of as relations, as predicates, and then you use logical connectives to connect them. So you get a logical formula which you can interpret in uh, zero one. It's either true or false, and this you take as a meaning of the sentence. But you know, I think it's very degenerate because they have all this nice uh, resource-sensitive structure of a partial ordered monoid, and then it is very nice and clear cut, and then you sort of collapse everything back to classical logic and work with conjunction of the structure. I don't know why people do. Anyway, but what uh, our computational 
Russian linguistics, Stephen Clark is interested in and works on, is another approach which they call distributed, distributional, with a vector space model of meaning. Where you really, instead of just saying, well, the meaning of a word is a relation and work with its truth values, you really work out what is the meaning of a word in a high dimensional vector space, the basis of which, in the worst case, you can think of as all the words in a dictionary, in English, for example, in an English dictionary. Well, however, it's not that bad, and normally, uh, when you are thinking about the word, you're in an application domain, for example, in a sport context, and you're only interested in the words that are important in a sport context, and then those will be the basis of the study. There are there will be examples. Um, okay. So, uh, so the symbolic model of meaning, so these two approaches we want to sort of compare. In the symbolic model of meaning, there are some problems. Well, it's composition of the graph, the types of the parts, uh, and then according to that, you assign to you get your predicates, you put them together with logical predicates, you get the meaning of the sentence. It's fully based on the meaning of the parts of the sentence. It's compositional. Well, it also, well, then you work with relations, you also you have a model theoretic model of meaning, thanks to Montague. I don't know if it is good or bad, but well, you have it. And then because then you are in a Boolean setting, then you can automate your logic and sort of doing the deductions yourself, make a computer do it for you. Okay. And then there are some uh, bad points, which is you can only say if the sentence is true or false. Well, is it the real meaning of a sentence? If the only thing I can say about the meaning of a sentence is that it's true, does it really give us anything? Uh, it's not very suitable for real-world text because being grammatical is very important in this setting and many sentences that are, for example, on the web not necessarily grammatically written. It says very little about the meaning of a word and then this is what I was saying, it forgets all this nice structure that we put on our syntax that for example, you cannot commute the words in a sentence, you cannot, if you have two times of words, it's not the same as having the word. You break it all down in, in a, to the classical logic where all these things are true. Uh, in the distributional model of meaning, it's highly non, it's totally non-compositional because you, you have the meaning of the words, you build the vector spaces for the meanings of the words, there is no known way to put them together to get the meaning of the sentence. But, but you get some real numbers for the meaning of your words. And then you know everything about the meaning of the words, but the meaning of the sentence is not very clear. So we, we want to be at the aim of the talk is sort of to say how to introduce mathematical formalism in which we can have the best of these two. So there is no con, this old cross. <laughs> <laughs> it's compositional and it's quantitative. You have numbers for the word and one, a way to compose them to get a number for the meaning of the sentence, a vector for the meaning of the sentence. Okay, so um, this is the high level of the, the big picture. Now I'm going to say something how, for example, this pre-group way of analyzing syntax works. So a pre-group is a partial order that monoid, where each element has a left, has a left and a right adjunct. But it's a monoid, we all know what it means, and one is a unit. Uh, it's a partial order, means that the uh, uh, partial order preserves the multiplication of the monoid in both uh, directions. So it's not quantitative, we have the terms of both ways. And that each element has a left and a right adjoint means that we've got four inequalities. Uh, the, the left agent pre-composed with the guy is going to stay less than one, and this will stay less than the element post-composing the left adjoint, and the other way around for the right agent. And that the unit of multiplication is uh, self adjoint These are actually enough, and then you can go on and prove other things like that. The left of the right adjoint is equal to identity, and that you have the left, left adjoint, you can have iterated adjoints, and that the moment multiplication is also self adjoint. So P multiplied P prime left is equal to PL, again the same multiplication 
in front of it. Um, okay, so what, uh, what are some examples of free groups? I'm of course very interested in the free groups that are not circular, that the left and right adjunct are not equal, and moreover you can iterate that twice having a left adjunct is not equal to having big ones. PLL is not equal to PL. Fortunately, there is a free group. The free free group exists. So this is the canonical model. And there are, for example, the set of all unbounded monotone maps on integers is also forms a non-circular free group. It's a very fun calculation to work, in, to work out. And then there are some, well, these are not really examples. This is like equivalent to the definition of a free group. For example, the set of all maps on a complete lattice that are join and meet preserving those they have Galois left and right and joins. And the Galois left and right agents are also join and meet preserving, so they also have Galois left and right agents, and you can iterate. An equivalent definition as well. Now, the set of all maps on a complete lattice when you, moreover, have a non involutive negation, and these maps, preserve the join and the negation, and their adjoints, the Galois adjoints, also preserve the join and negation. This also forms a non-circular free group. And it's, I guess it's uh, sort of obvious that if this negation is involutive, then your uh, non-circular free group will collapse down to a circular free group. Twice of the left adjoint will be equal to once. And also very degenerated form of form of a pre-group is when the left and right adjuncts are equal, then you get a group. So some mm. How does this apply to linguistics? Oh. So don't consider the sentence uh, John likes Mary. <laughs> oh, I changed it. I don't know, I forgot to change it. <laughs> so we assign, because we work in the free pre group generated from a basic set of times with some partial orders on that. For example, uh, we, in our fixed uh, set of types, we could pi for subject, these are very rough. O for object and S for a declarative sentence. And now in the sentence John likes Mary, we assign pi to John or to Mary. This is a subject, that's an object. And the transitive verb needs some uh, thinking. So how do we think about a verb? Well, how about it, that it's an operation, it's a function that takes a, a subject and it has to be on its left and we put a right here. <laughs> and an object it has to be on its right and we put a left. And if you give these two guys to it in, in this correct order, it will give you a sentence. Uh, so, these things that I said, it, the pre-group sort of proves it automatically for you. If you assign a pi to this guy, this type, this compound type to verb, and all to marry, then you can use the adjunction inequalities and prove that this is actually a grammatical sentence because at the end, you stay less than s. Very easy. So many different sentences, we have some types of constituents, uh, and I use the axiomatics to see to what does it reduce. Some more examples, actually, very sort of compositional. John likes Mary, so then once you assign a type to a transitive verb like this, then the ideal is that you will not change it. Whenever you see a transitive verb, you just put it like that. Um, transitive verb in the present sense. Now, how do we type questions? So to the question word, we also think about it uh, functionally. So if you give to it a subject, and it's right. And an infinitive verb, I, after the subject, then it will give you a, a phrase of type question. And if you do your calculation and here like you are subject because it's in infinitive tense and I, then you get what you want. And then let's uh, consider another case when John likes Mary in the library. <laughs> so John bought a book from the library. So I also have a locative object if you want. Uh, mm, so now likes, now we have to also consider a locative uh, object for the verb. That's why I put this omega L here. 
conduct in the, in the, the library is a noun form, and in gets a type that if you give a noun to it on the right, then it will give you a locative object, and then everything again types. Just have an idea how the state works. So it helps to the whole sense to know what to assign to likes. So the first sentence, likes is something. It's assigned something different than the last sentence. Yes, yeah, so, so if I was going to do it correctly, in the first sentence I should have put the double in, because like also can get a locative object. Okay, this will still then give you a statement. So there seems a double word left over. On top? There are always to deal with these things. Okay. Yes, I, I don't want to go into it. Yet. There are ways to deal with these things. What if, you, what if your sentences weren't grammatical? Then you don't get S at the end, and then you know that your sentence is not grammatical. What about words that mean two different things in different contexts? So this has been applied to the elementary fragment of many languages. So this is such a simple structure to work with people uh, can easily take it and then apply it to a language they're interested. So the boring ones are English, French, Italian, German, Latin, more interesting, Polish, good. But the more interesting ones I find is Turkish, Japanese, Arabic, and I did for Persian. And it worked so well. I think so. Uh, I could actually, without change, without doing any, how do you call it, uh, change, without doing any tailoring, I could actually analyze this as a poem by Omar Khayyam. I could actually directly analyze it, and this is the reduction of the second verse. It works very swiftly. Uh, okay. Very compositional. Do you agree? So, uh, how about on the meaning side? Then things don't work as, uh, as you, as intuitively as you want. It sort of becomes a little bit ad hoc. For example, uh, John likes Mary. This is if the thing, Google about Microsoft, the whole thing you think of, what is the meaning of my sentence? Well, it's composed of the meaning of a noun phrase and a verb phrase. And what is the meaning of a verb phrase? Well, it consists of the meaning of my verb which I will think of as a function, this is a lambda calculus term for a function, and it also needs a noun phrase on the right. It doesn't tell, tell us anything about the meaning of the words, does it? At the end, the noun phrase will be the Microsoft, and the body you think of as a relation, which will connect a noun phrase to a noun phrase, and if it does so, you assign truth while you want to. It doesn't say anything about the meaning. However, on the distribution of model of the meaning things become much more interesting. So this from so Stephen Clark tells me that uh, the distribution model of meaning is based on a quote, so you can best describe it, it's best described by a quote by first, that you shall know a person by his friends, <laughs> you shall know a word by the company he keeps. And the intuition is that the meaning of words like cat and dog are similar. Cat and dog are sort of the same meaning because they can both uh, sleep, run, and walk. Uh, they can both be bald, clean, stroke, and they can both be small, big, and fairy. So they both occur close to these other words, run, walk, fairy, big. So they sort of have the same meaning. And these facts are actually reflected in the context, because cat and dog, as I said, appear as the subject, both of them appear as the subject of the verbs sleep, run, walk, as the object of both clean stroke and as the modify of the adjective small big and fair. And in practice, how do these things work? How do we actually say, how do we say that these guys are close to some other words? Is that if you fix uh, a window of n words for every word and then you look to which word they are close to. And then you count those other words in a high dimensional vector space to get the meaning of the word that you are interested in. For example, uh, think of this guy, which one is more fairy, a cat or a dog, uh, a, cat. a cat. So this is a cat, uh, and I assume that your vector space has three bases, clean, sleep, and fairy. And then, so cat is, the cat projection on the fairy is, for example, one and a half, the dog is just a half, the cats sleep more, so this goes to two, and they need to be clean more. 
but the dogs have all these guys but less, with less numbers. Actually, you can compare now the meaning of the word cat and dog in terms of these things. Dogs are less furry, they sleep less, and they need to be less clean than cats. Because hmm? if you project them, then all the values are less. Uh, so people ask, does it work? It doesn't, you need high dimensional vector space, but does it work? So there have actually been a lot of implementations. Stephen Clark says that the best one is uh, the work of Kura. They actually created condensed vectors from 2 billion words of text and then compared uh, the context vectors to find synonym words automatically in a program. So how, let's see some examples. How does the program work? For example, to introduction in this, uh, how many billion, was it 2 billion, 2 billion words of text? Uh, what are the words using this vector space model uh, synonym to introduction? Launch, implementation, advent, addition, adoption, arrival, absence, inclusion, creation. So I would say, I don't know, I'm not, my language, my first language is English. I don't think this is a very good one, but the next one is better. Evalu evaluation is assessment, examination, appraisal, review, audit, analysis, consultation, monitoring, testing, verification. They all make sense. And method, technique, procedure, means, approach, strategy, tool, concept, practice, formula, tactic. So it makes perfect sense. I think the first one's fine, but the problem is introduction has lots of meanings. Lots of different meanings. Yeah, so I, I had a problem with introduction and creation. Yes, and absence, because you know it, it does tend to group words together with their negatives. Because they tend to occur in exactly the same context. So, so somebody it, told me that the fact that you use the introduction as the first chapter of a book, it's because it's the creator of it. So it makes sense to think of it as a creation. So you don't have a problem? <laughs> huh? If it said on the first day, it got introduced. Yes, somebody also. <laughs> yes, there is. Actually, it's not the truth. There is some biblical example like that. Like if you trace back the meaning of the word, got it, yeah. But this, this book presupposes you know what some of the world is in the first place. Yes, it's a little bit simpler. I mean, if I gave you a dictionary, a Chinese dictionary, entirely in Chinese, could you work out what any of the words there meant? Yes, a little bit simpler, but however, it's not just simpler. No, but you could take a, you could take a, a huge raft of Chinese text and use it to automatically produce a Chinese thesaurus, knowing nothing about Chinese, right. presumably. Well, Chinese people might find that useful. But for context, if you have uh, context, is it, I'm say, uh, it can be exchanged uh, by synonyms, words in the context, would it count like the same uh, context if you change this context by synonymous words made by this man? You see? That's, again, the circular thing. I mean, if, if you have in context, logic, you take a context and change everything with your synonym. In certain applications, you're not interested in the meaning, but just that meanings are the same. Like if you type in a world in Google, then I also want yeah. to find the other occurrences with, with the same meaning without actually knowing what the mean. So the search engine doesn't care about the meaning, it just wants to find things which are related. What? We do care about meaning. Yeah. So the application here, yeah. so it's actually, it has. The best ability is to, com to compare, to compare the meaning of the words. And, and that's actually a way that you don't actually need to build these high dimensional vectors to compare the meaning of the word because you can use the inner product instead of the tensor product and so on. So what is the definition of context? Yes. Yeah. I don't know, you have to write, run the program on context. To see. So the question is how to bring the compositionality of the algebraic type in to this distributed meaning, so that, that, that you have some numbers based on your basis for words, uh, and then you want to put it together to get the meaning of a sentence. Uh, so that's where Stephen Clark was actually, he, look, he was looking for, and he had some ideas of putting, putting these guys together, the vectors, together using the tensor product. So we thought what mathematical structure actually captures both, both of these guys. 
the algebraic way of analyzing the syntax and these uh, distributional ways of analyzing the semantics. And three groups are compact closed categories, we all agree. Sort of a set of compact closed categories. And web finite dimensional vector spaces are also compact closed categories, so why don't we actually work? You mean they form a compact closed category? category. Sorry? You mean they form a compact closed category? They form a compact closed category. No, they are, are they in are. the non symmetric sense of compact closed yeah. They form in the sense that objects are vectors and uh, maps oh, are here, okay. maps are there. So there's something more. What's it, so what, are the, yeah. what are the morphisms? Linear yeah, maps. Yeah. maps. But uh, you say objects are vectors, so you take one of your shapes. Individuals. No, objects are vectors. Yes, Do they, they live in the same space? Yes, they, they live all in the same yeah. space? Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, Mary and uh, Light, so they're, they're both in the same vector, vector space? Yeah, vector it's the same form of it, of sets as objects, how, what are the other? I'm happy with the previous one. I think maybe it would be better if only one person talked at a time. Yes, right. So, Compact closed categories are monoidal closed categories, where each object has a left and right adjoint. And then people use this weird diagrammatic form, which is really in, unintuitive, I would say. For <laughs> objects, you put a line. I mean, I want to put a line for an arrow. <laughs> That's what we do. For arrows, you put a box. Except for some of them, you don't put a box, you again put a line. <laughs> and if you want to compose, <laughs> and if you want to compose, okay, you can compose sequentially, you put them on top of each other. And then you can also, well, there's a tensor product, and this is like you put one object in close to another one, it's as if you really are taking the tensor product, you can take the tensor product of a morphism with an object. Yeah, identity on the object. And you can also do parallel composition on the morphisms. And then you can co combine the two sequential and parallel. And that elements, the vectors, then you can uh, recover using the unit of the tensor. So the map from the unit to each object, you think of as a vector. And then the other direction is something weird, which is what a co-vector. <laughs> And Jamie says they have they have some physical interpretation that in CERN they observe them actually. The co the co. And then if you compose them, you get a number. You get a number. It's the probability of something. Okay. Uh, uh -huh. And then uh, this object has a left and right adjoint. So uh, there are here is the non symmetric case, right? So we have actually four maps instead of Epsilon eta, you have epsilon left, eta right. Uh, epsilon left, e epsilon right. Eta left, e eta right. And uh, there is a map. Uh, if you pre-tensor the left adjoint with the guy, you get a map to identity. And let's denote it now by a line instead of a box. <laughs> and the other way around, and similarly for the ethers. And they have to satisfy some axioms, the yanking axiom, that if you do an epsilon followed by an eta, as if you did nothing. And there's four of them now. Okay. Uh, uh, and and, and three groups are compact closed categories. The objects of the post set of your post set are the, the elements of the post set are the objects of the category. And the partial order is a morphism, so there's at most one arrow between any two objects. I think this is called what? A thin category? Small category? Thin. The tensor is the moment multiplication and the unit is the unit. Adjoints are adjoints and the epsilon maps now are uh, that, that if you post compose the right adjoint you stay less than one. So here's your map. <coughs> if you stay less than one you say this is the less than this because so there is an arrow between this and this. Similarly for the uh, left adjoint and two for, for the others. And now uh, if you want to type the sentence John likes Mary, you can actually write down really category theoretically a morphism. This is like this is a witness that your sentence is typed. You put a morphism one after the other. Epsilon refers 
do an epsilon right on these guys, then do nothing on the sentence, and then do an epsilon left on these guys, and these are the cops, and then you get the type of the sentence. So, uh, what are you thinking about? Sentences as a composition of their types very syntactically, instead you can think of them as reduction diagrams, right? There's a very uh, minimal geometry to this reduction. So sentence, instead of thinking of it first in terms of words, second in terms of the composition of the types, now you can really think of it as a cup, a line, and a cup. Why is this good? So then you can sort of throw away your sentence and look at the geometry of the reduction. And this is good, huh? So these guys, so I considered one sentence, something like John likes Mary in the library. I bought a book from the bookshop. Some sentence like that. And in English, I'm, so I then throw away the sentence and look at the reduction patterns in different languages. In English and French, they have the same reduction pattern. So there's, there's three things parallel going on, right? This guy, this guy, and this guy. And if you do them all correctly, then you get the type of the sentence. And for this, you need, need two levels of nesting. You have to wait a little bit to do the reduction. Um, for Arabic and Hebrew, they are also the same. And it's very different from English and French. Now, first you have to wait a little bit, then do two things, for which you have to also wait a little bit. And then, so you have two parallel blocks, one is on nesting two, and then you get your thing at the beginning. So it already says that now you can even grow the verb is at the beginning, whereas in English and French it's in the middle. So you can say a lot of things like that. And in Persian and Hindi, you get the same structure. It's much more complicated. Uh, it reflects the way people think, I guess. <laughs> Uh, and, and, well, if, so you can sort of compare sentences of different languages. And probably this is maybe a coincidence, maybe not, that these two guys have both uh, descendants of Sanskrit, and these are Semite languages, so they have the same root, same reduction patterns always. And then using these scalars that show up in compact clause categories, you can actually talk about comparing these sentences. So this was syntactic comparison, I'm nothing about meaning. Uh, by assigning, for example, what is the degree of nesting? You find something about the degree of nesting, but two times epsilon, but there are no eta maps here, but we think as imaginary ones. So the degree of nesting here, you can say it's two, here it's two, so as a federal, and then it's four. So that's something about, for example, quantitative comparison of the complexity of parsing of sentences in different languages. Without saying anything about meaning, we can actually say a lot about language. Uh, okay, so vector spaces, the meaning part, uh, these are also compact clause categories. So vector spaces are the objects, in and of morphisms, tensor products, and if you need some real numbers. Adjoints are identity. Um, and both tells me that epsilon maps are very important because they are actually, they do the inner product for you. If uh, I have a vector in here and a vector in there, and what this epsilon map is actually doing is taking the, uh, the inner product of these guys for me. And this is the thing I was telling you yesterday that I would so much like to write this as a pair, but exactly the entangled ones stop you from doing so and you need the summation. Uh, and the atom maps are apparently bell states. <laughs> Great bell states. Well, well you know, there is the Einstein convention, actually. You know, no. That in, in differential geometry and relativity, we don't write the summation. It's just understood oh. that the repeated index is summed over. Mm -hmm. Does it mean there's no entanglement and there's you, you play with the indexes to provide the It's just notationally, you just don't write. And what is the linguistic sense of linear maps? Oh, yeah. uh, so the mathematical formalism which was working is like the first thing that comes to mind. Let's pair the syntax with the semantics. So you work with in the product of one pre-group, seen as a compact plus category, and the one category of a, a, and the category of finite dimensional vector spaces. The objects are paired, a vector space and its grammatical types. 
Morphisms are pairs, uh, linear map from V to W, a partial order between P and Q. Tensor is pointwise, uh, and, there, and then we're going to ask that if you have a vector space whose type is composite, then you should be able to decompose this vector space to two vector spaces, each of them corresponding to one of these guys. So V should be of type P and W of type Q. This is a restriction. As if you are working the image of a functor from this pre-group to this guy. So we mimic closely 100% the, the things that are dictated to us by the pre-group. Don't have a composite object if they don't have composite types. And adjuncts and unit and everything else is point to us. Um, so, so how does it work? So the sentence John likes Mary, we have subject, a transitive verb, an object. Now we think of them as pairs, a vector space and its type, a compound vector space and its compound type, and similarly on the other side. Uh -huh. So uh, the vector, the, the types are easy because, well, these pre-group guys have been applied to a lot of languages, we now know how to work with them. But how about the vector, the meaning? So for the subject, uh, it's a simple, it has a simple type, so you just look in the normal way of assigning a vector space meaning to a word in a high dimensional vector space. So Stephen Clark knows how to do this. Because the program runs it, it gives you, given the basis, the meaning of John. Similar for the meaning of Mary. But our formalism tells us, he can do the same for the meaning of life, but we don't want to. We say, eh, well, our formalism tells us that T should be the tensor product of three things, each of them A of this type, B of this type, C of this type. And uh, we are looking for, in our category, a map, that if we came up with the right A, B, and C, and we put it here, and then we take the tensor product of these three pairs, then we should have a reduction of the type of this S in some vector space big S. We are yet to build it. And then because we know the partial order guys, the pre-group guys, uh, we're really focused in the vector space and we're really looking for this map. From V tends to TW to S, to some S. So, um, having in mind that T should be the tensor product of three things, one of them V, one of them W, one of them a third thing, how do we actually build it? How do we start even thinking about it? Well, then we use the same ideas uh, as that you can think of the verb as any type that has a compound, as, a, as any entity that has a compound type, as a function really, especially if these guys are adjunct. They're really like variable holders. So we really think of this T as a function, as a linear map, as a map that takes something of this kind as a variable here, something of this kind as a variable there, and produces something of a third kind. But now we cannot put this in our reduction in the tensor because this is a Cartesian product. What do we do? So by the universal property of the tensor, we know that for any such map, there is this also a map from the tensor product to us. So the universal property of the tensor tells me that I can replace that Cartesian product with a tensor. And now we do Bob's trick uh, to replace this linear map with the tensor product of the three guys. Creating a lot, of, a lot more entanglements. And then the compact closed structure actually gives, me, gives us this map that we were looking for the map from the tensor product of V, T, W to S. What is it? Well, do epsilon, inner products here, two inner products here, and nothing in the middle. Uh, so this is my version of the pictures. So if you have a vector, if you have a vector here, like some vector V, and some vector W, you do your epsilon. Here, with the variable holder of V, 
in the superposed vector that lived in the tensor product in the middle, you do the same, and then you get something of the type S. So the guys that are in there, they actually look like this, the tensor product. And what does the F map do? What do these epsilons do? They're actually really substituting the V that is there in the variable VI that is in the superposed guy in the middle by taking the inner product. So we're actually pairing these two, pairing these two, and then taking the scanner equation with this type of inner product. So inner product is as substituting the values that we know, V and W, John and Mary, into the variable holders of the variable likes. So let's see, you actually have a functor between the, cat the language category and the category of vector space. Yeah. So that, yeah. No, you're, you're, you're quantizing the language. So the yes, so the sub so the substitution, in a product of substitution. So the first part it really happens when you actually create that superposed element. So instead of working here, you really work with the superposed element here. And thus get this guy. So create new kind of ones here. And the second one is the epsilon map that actually allows us to replace these guys with the correct ones in the left hand right hand side. Uh, okay, so, so this is very elementary, right? So this is the gist of what should go on in this mathematical format. So if somebody gives you a phrase, uh, first to, to, to know the meaning of the phrase, first grammatically type it. For simple types, derive the vector space using the known method. For compound types, form a linear map. And then with this prescription that I just showed, we form the meaning map. And then, and then this will give you the meaning of the two sentences. What are some examples? So the most simple case is uh, the Montague style semantics, 0, 1, as meaning of sentences, either true or false. This we can capture easily. It becomes very trivial in our setting. For example, John likes Mary, well, okay, so this is the pre-group typing. Assume that for simplicity, uh, God, when he created man, he actually enumerated all of them. <laughs> Called all the, all Adam, Adam is the guy, right? Adam, and he enumerated all of them. And this guy that we're talking about is actually the third of those. The son of the son of Adam. <laughs> and also the same for uh, females, they're all called Eve and they're all numbered. Uh, so... <laughs> I feel it works much better than you, bro. So the vector space of the first guide is just the span of this Jones, and the vector space of the Mary, the female, the span of Mary. And how it likes? Well, okay, let's think of it as a linear map. So each element in this space, where you do all those tricks, should be written as a superposition of John I's, Mary J's, and something like I J in the middle. And what is like I J? Now here is a little bit of messy. Why not we assign one to it? So we work actually work in a one-dimensional vector space. Assign a one to it. If the sentence John I likes Mary J is true, that's what people do in Montague style semantics. And if it is not true, send it to the origin. I'm sorry, but I mean, if, if somebody says John likes Mary, there's a, a range of things that can mean. How much does he like Mary? You know, I mean, yes, it's coming up next, a couple of minutes. Okay. Okay. They can do this in the set where it's Montague style semantic, and they haven't done what you say the range. But we can do it here easily. So then what they do is they say, okay, it's true if John likes Mary. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Tarski. Thank you very much, Mr. Montague. You don't want that. Okay, now, so the whole thing is that if you then apply these epsilons here between John I and John III, Mary J in the likes and Mary IV, and these are the inner products you have to take. At the end, it means that we need to look at if John III likes Mary IV is true or not. So this the likes is, is, is compound Mary type, or not? Yeah. Okay. So this is easy, huh? Not interesting. However, uh, how about we actually want to talk about range of 
liking, for example, how, how about if we put likes equal to three fourths loving and one fourth hating? And then we sort of convince ourselves that love and hate are really emotions and we don't need any meaning. We really feel if you love someone or hate them. <laughs> Usually at the same like time. Them. Usually at the same time. <laughs> for some people, yeah. Like the superposition principle. Yeah. <laughs> But this is not bad, by the way, so much <coughs> So, okay, uh, now... It's used for many worlds. Many worlds are good for everything. Whether <laughs> 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 well, you are variables, you have many worlds. So, um, so now we build likes instead of a one-dimensional vector space. Two, two-dimensional vector space. If John loves Mary, we put it to the L. Uh, dimension, he hates it, we put it to the H dimension, two dimension vector space, and then we work out the meaning similarly as before, but however here we can actually really compare the meaning, for example, how close is uh, John loving Mary to John liking Mary, or three-fourths close, if there's three-fourths intersection between the two meanings, loving and liking, three-fourths close to each other. How about love and hate? Well, zero, the better be zero. Okay, um, so relations, beta relations, probably. So are you letting your verbs have internal variables to them? Uh -huh. Are you allowing, I mean, you're allowing your nouns to have an internal variable. Can the verb have an internal variable too? What is the internal variable of nouns? Well, you're saying, I mean, the noun is one, John is one of the set of all Johns, so it's an internal variable. John 1, John 2, John 3. Yes, it's for some, so I have to build a vector space for John. Right. Well, maybe there's a vector space for like too. There is, actually, but we don't want to use it directly, like Rolly, like that. We want uh -huh. to do some manipulation. That, for the similar, similar way, you can build a vector space for like too. So, but let's come back to this uh, Boolean semantics that people have uh, been using. But it's really circular, isn't it? Because we want to learn after assigning meaning to the sense that John likes Mary. But then we say it's true if John likes Mary. If the sense that John likes Mary is true. But if you're in the uh, set theoretic semantics, you can really, your hands are closed. Well, it's not as easy to think about what does the truth of John like Mary mean. It's either zero or one, that's what you can do. But here we can actually play with it, like saying John likes Mary, making range on it. Then I just thought of some silly examples. For example, syntactically, you have this big two billion uh, corpus of text. So you say, okay, John I likes Mary J is true, if and only if in your, in your big collection of text, John I and Mary J appear adjacent to the word likes. And then, then you, 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 arrange, you know, let it vary at least one time, more than one time, n times, and you can play with the word n. In the sentences of your document. So if you see the sentence John likes Mary 201,000 200, times, then John should really like Mary. Otherwise, why would that sentence appear in your text? So according to your text, John likes Mary. Because the sentence is there. But up to some not negation appearing here and there. And then some more silly thing, because in France, it's actually it can be derived if in your text, instead of looking for John likes Mary, you look for John buys Mary Rosa. In the Scottish context, I guess in England, all singers like rugby players. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if in your text you see that the sentence Mary J is a singer is there, and John I is a rugby player, and isn't there, you can say John I likes Mary. And if you're religious, all religious men like nuns, I suppose. So <laughs> they all like Mary, if Mary J goes to church, they all, they all like that. Um, so this is just some silly examples. Um, so at the end, also this, this, these all should become more uh, formal. But Bob tells me that uh, if you have a vector because I will fix the base, then you can actually, uh, for your linear map, you can write the matrix. And in this uh, vector because that I showed, we have, we have the unit R, so the uh, elements are over the field of reals, but this actually doesn't have to be a field. Any semi-ring will, will do to get a matrix for a linear map. Uh, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and if you have this method, instead of working with a field of reals R, you work with any semi-ring, 
And these matrices and those vectors actually form a compact loss category. So we don't actually to, to, to maintain our mathematical structure as a compact loss category. We don't have to stick to R. And why do we have to stick to R anyway? For example, in these Boolean examples that I showed, they're really working on, on the ring of Boolean numbers. Zeros and ones. And then you can do logical manipulations with them. And the category in which uh, the matrices range over zeros and ones is actually as well the category of finite dimensional relation sets and finite dimensional relations of them. So, what happens is that if actually what we were doing in this Boolean semantics is actually really working here. So our category actually becomes also related to something much simpler here. And this is what people work in if you want to think about the category when they work in this mountain view model. So it's a, it's a special case. The symbolic model of meaning becomes a special case of what we do. Vector, using vectors. This is my last slide. Uh, no. So the conclusions, I don't want to say. So Stephen is really determined to implement this and do some real examples of real text and see how it works. How this proposition about building vector space for compound for words with compound types for works. Uh, so, yeah. so we only use the epsilon max in the reductions. And can we actually think of the eto max as having some uh, linguistic meaning? And a very trivial way of thinking is that probably then you can use them to generate meaningful sentences if you're like, reversing the, the operation. And there's some nice things that show up like that simple times are just vectors, uninteresting. However, the compound times are superpositions, and that's where the entanglement becomes important. And in our product, there's like improved theory, people say cut elimination is just substitution, and everybody's excited. So here we say, okay, uh, inner product is really substitution. substitution. And uh, something else, very, very mildly, is that uh, is the similar structures in physics and linguistics that are interesting. Um, for example, Lambda couples of 50 years ago, if you complete them, you get quantiles, quantum locales introduced for uh, non commutative cases in the quantum in physics, with the same structures. And now, 42 years later, 50 years later, actually, the pre groups or compact loss categories also go. Is this vector space S capital? What is S? Is that vector space of all possible sentences or something? It's supposed to be the vector space of uh, the meaning of the sentence. All possible meaning. So, what's the basis for that vector space? Well, it's built. So, we're built. so what's the For example, I don't 
moment you put, if you Google, you put one word, and then this vector, one word in the Google, for example, dog, and you want to fetch all the documents that are somehow related to the word dog. So this vector space model of meaning helps, right? Because it tells, okay, the meaning of the dog, look for all the documents in which uh, stroke and bot and sleep are ten, uh, ten places close to dog. How about if I want to put a sentence in Google? For example, Stephen Clark says if you want to do a search to buy a plane ticket to somewhere, you would like really to put an example. If you have constraints, like I want to go from Venice to Florence, and I want my uh, ticket to be in the morning. So you really want to put more than one word. You really want to form a sentence. And this will probably then help you to get documents. So it seems that you're um, taking the point of view that meaning is something objective, that meaning is inherent in the language. But isn't there another side to it too, that everybody means something a little bit different, and that the nuances of meaning change? Change the model. You have a different uh, but, model I mean, but, but I mean, at the same time, different people mean different things. But I mean, if A says John loves Mary, and B says you know, you know, John loves Mary, you know, means something completely different, or you're just not looking at that aspect. But the meaning is really depending on the corpus of text that you are working with. You take Bible as your, I think you want the real meaning of words, you take something like Quran or Bible. <laughs> <laughs> if you take Bible, you of course get different meanings than if you get Darwin's book. You see what I mean? Meaning here is it's based on a big text. On, on, on a huge no, corpus of texts. You take the point of view that the fundamental thing is texts rather than people or society or anything else. The, the, the well, the people wrote the texts, but these are the Actually, you know that there are people in library science now who are worrying about how to design large computer research systems to make them uh, more user friendly. And I, I, I bet they, some of them think about things. Actually, my, my wife is writing a thesis on that. <laughs> but they actually do worry about uh, trying to figure out how the people who are going to use the system uh, will think in order to make the system different what they really want. So this has something to do with the you know, shared meaning. Yeah. So. This is really the meaning is based on the text that you use, <coughs> like a huge collection of texts, or just one text. How you do uh, if you say Jim likes a picture of uh, the role, the Mary and the Ro and the Rose? Oh, see, Jim saw the picture of the Mary and the Rose. How you do do this? The same way. But there's two meanings. Oh, there's ambiguity. And How many things did he like? Just the picture, or the picture of the Mary? And the rose, two things. And the ambiguity is reflected in the syntactic analysis. You should do first a uh, formal translation and then apply your model. Nothing keeps you from, you, you say, if you go to your formal translation, you will have a zero one. That's false. You can interpret your formulas in all sorts of logics. Nothing prevents you to, to take a, uh, even the reals, if you prefer, or some lattice for the truth values. And nothing prevents you take your individuals a set. Well, a set uh, you can make it numbers, a vector of numbers. And you can add, uh, how you add, for example, Mary and, and Eva. Jim likes Mary and Eva. How do you add them? Because you need a Frobenius algebra. <laughs> no, you, you, this is a, it's extra. Anyhow, you cheat because you have to, to guess what the thing is. Okay. You have to make it for each, you have to have an algorithm which gives you, in general, a sentence. You have an algorithm which gives you the, the linear map. You have to calculate it very fast. There is a mechanical way of calculating, but there is a prescription for the meaning map. But, how do you, but if it's a big sentence, you will not go, you only read it and then type it in. You want that. There's a computer on the program. So what's the uh, algorithm on the program the does program? it for you. And what's and then you need the structure. I can write it as a program, no? Oh? Well, I have a prescription. If you give me the meaning of the constituents, yeah, I know okay. where are the Okay, so your prescription is heights, 
the formula. It, it creates the formula. The substitution, it gives you the hierarchy of the things. You have it in there, but you just didn't go in complicated enough sentences to see it yourself, I have an impression. So you are... Yeah. You can... The, the whole point about going categorical is to hide the details. Right? Pardon me? The whole point about going high level... It doesn't prevent you from... Not to work with... To no. hide the details in a way that... But you yeah, can but say something about meaning of all sentences instead of getting confused about meaning of one sentence in the calculation. Because you have, you do not want to be meeting every sentence you want to interpret somehow for your Google search machine, no? Sure. You want to give a number. Mm -hmm. So first have to apply your recipe to that sentence. John That's Mary. what you said. Well, yes. That's why I asked you the question a little bit more complicated. Okay. So you how have to, look? Oh, okay. you so can now put them on the same, you can see, you put them on the same level. If I the simple sentence John likes Mary, and make the sentence more complicated, like John said that he likes Mary, how would the formalism work? Uh -huh. Another example, yes, it's another example, but... I don't think it's hard to work out, but of course but then uh, the problem is that verbs, of course, are intuitive to think of as functions, take object, take subject. This doesn't how, about the, how about that? Because this that doesn't prevent you to do that. This comes afterwards, what you do. That's what I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> I just want to make, what I think is a strong analogy of physics here is the fact that it's an experimental science very much. And also like in physics you got a, a, a thing like Bell inequality. Then there comes the amazing engineering task to actually realize. Like Bell inequality was something which took 20, 25 years just to engineer the setup to, to make it work. And then you got experimental verification where, where actually your thing works. And these sort of things are very experimental. People, people in this in this business are very much engineers, sort of, to see which approach works. Okay, so last question. But is there a way uh, by this technique, uh, how say, to uh, to make a paraphrase? A paraphrase. You have two phrases, and whether it makes sense to have the same meaning. Yeah, it's, it's something linguistic, right? You can paraphrase, uh, make a paraphrase. No, I mean, we can just retell something in, as we say, different words, right? So there are kind of transform, possible transformation of phrase which preserve meaning, right? It's actually one of ideal meaning is something which is preserved by particular transformation. It also looks kind of categorical. Yeah, I don't think of linear that But say if you, you apply this analysis to two different phrases, even if say possible, you have the same outcome, which would allow you to say it's the same meaning. But that's what I'm doing here, no? Because I say, okay, well, how is the meaning? If I put here, for example, John loves Mary and John likes Mary, they have sort of the same meaning, but they're not totally the same. Mm -hmm. If I take the inner product, I get three fourths. It means three fourths of the times they have the same meaning. Taking the inner product of the meaning of the sentence in that meaning space, then you can compare the meaning here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is, I guess, some. Okay. So let's thank our speaker again.